Nostalgia, C.A. Lewis. The door stretched on its brass leash so Ella could see a panel of the darkened room from where she stood. Nothing had changed, she realized, as her eyes slid along the doorway from the thick pile carpet that had been walked to a filthy brown grass to the curtain's faded roses. Only the vase of flowers that quivered above the black and white television set was still as fresh and bright as it had been ten years before. I'm not coming in? You're not asking me in? Ella asked, her voice thinning and changing pitch, even though she had promised herself she would stay calm. It's me, Ella, she added, her voice even more perilous as she caught snatches of slow, heavy movements through the slit between the door and frame as the old woman came close, retreated, and then slowly moved to unbolted. Mother, it's me, she said again, trying to steady her voice and smiling purposefully as the woman pulled open the door across the mat that read welcome in faded letters and stood staring at her daughter. Ella opened her arms slowly, stepped forward and reached around the old woman. She would have held in longer than she did were it not for the unrecognizable odor that reached her, somewhere between old age and defeat, unlike the musky smell she remembered of her mother, part tigress, part yardlies of London. Ella stepped back, looked at her mother again and tried to smile. The old girl was still as particular as she'd always been. Here she was in the middle of the day, alone in her flat, wearing a green cardigan, matching floral skirt and blouse, brown beads, and a line of red lipstick that crossed the crease where her mouth had once been. You look good, Ella said as she entered the room. I'm not here for long. Two more weeks before I have to go back. I called from London. Tried to leave a message with the neighbors, but they said you weren't speaking to them. Said you had fallen out with everyone in the building. Ella shot out and immediately regretted her words as she stood in the middle of the room, the arch of her back and the corpses that her legs had become, refusing a seat. It had been ten years since she had last seen her mother. Ella counted the years, mentally marking off birthdays. She had been twenty-five when she left. And here she was at thirty-five and still picking the wrong words. I'll be reasonable. Composed. She had repeated the words first to her husband, left to wonder the city's better vantages on his own, and then herself as she made her way across town towards the place where she had grown up. It's behind you. No need to taint the future with things that can't be changed. No, the past is over. She had reassured herself again and again as she got out of the hired taxi in Church Street and walked the last bit on her own through the square, no longer filled with whiffs of fruit growing rancid in the hot sun or fried fish from lucky takeaways latching onto the evening breeze. The square now was filled with weighty odor of truncated boudoirs being bride on grills on the pavement and lingering exhaust fumes emanating from the cavalcade of taxis parked at the outskirts of the square. The aging building, though, still stood resolute on the square. Like a tart all dressed up with nowhere to go, her mother had always said. Some architect had taken great pains to sculpt delicate curlicues at the corners of the constructions and had defied the blueprint for the buildings in those areas back then by adding wooden arched windows instead of the tin rectangles that poor children in similar buildings elsewhere stared from. A man sitting at the side of the square, his black hair knotted into dirty tufts that formed a halo around his head, had shaken his tin at Ella as she walked by. Alarmed, she'd taken a step away from him and walked faster still. Ella had lifted her wide blue cotton skirt above her knees so she could climb the stairs two at a time, as if that would speed her past the broken glass and odors that rose from the stained floors like mist. I looked forward to seeing you. You never wrote back, but I heard from the neighbors that you were well. I wanted to see you, hoped that you would be all right, she said, watching as her mother gingerly felt her way back to her favorite chair in the corner of the room. See if I'm dead, you mean. I got nothing to leave you. Why bother, the old woman said finally, as she sat upright on the once lovely velvet chair and stroked the balding armrest as if it were an ugly cat. I didn't come to fight. Honestly, I just wanted to see you make peace the words slipped from between ella's lips so hesitantly that they seemed to stall midway before they reached the old lady but she had heard her after all peace is a word for people at war there was no war you just left remember no fight no anger just left 
The old woman turned away from Ella and looked out at the square through the wooden window frames that shaped the sky into arcs. No, no, mummy, of course there was no war. It was just that we seemed to engage in battle so easily, you and I, Ella said, feeling foolish because her practiced words had sounded so hollow. Engage in battle, her mother repeated, sweetening her voice too much. Listen, you call it what you like, but where I come from, you don't just run off, scream, shout, cause a scene. But to just run off like that, like a thief in the middle of the night? We weren't at war. I didn't leave without telling you. You just didn't want to know that I was going. You refused to open the door when I came to say goodbye, remember? I stood outside, banging on the door, begging for you to open up. Remember that? Ella said as she grabbed at her wedding band and twisted it impatiently around her finger. Okay, I didn't. Maybe this was a bad idea. I should leave? Ella asked carefully and neatened her skirt unnecessarily. No, don't leave, the old woman mumbled, almost inaudibly. I read your letters, her mother started anew. Read you were doing good over there, got married with a nice house and job. You live good. Ella felt the words rather than heard them. I'm happy. My husband, you would like him, I think. And yes, we live well. I chose the life I wanted, Ella said, still standing. I asked that you visit many times, but you never even wrote back, Ella said, the polite coating of her voice rubbing away as she said the last bit to reveal the bitterness beneath. Ella walked to the window from where she could see the market. Her hand moved to her hair automatically and fidgeted with her streaked brown hair. Her elegant fingers climbed across her shoulders over the raw silk blouse en route to where she usually wore her diamond pendant, but she had left it in the hotel safe that day. The charm of the block of flats had always been watered by the square's necklace of dirt bins and plastic bags that drifted about the place like escaped party balloons. As far as Ella could recall, she had always wanted to leave the enclosure where no quiet or peace existed where music played all day long, so there was no respite, even on a Sunday, and where privacy was just a term for people that lived in fancy houses on the other side of the line. Neighbors knew your middle name and intimate details because the thin walls dividing one family from another kept nothing sacred. And then there was always fresh disagreement brewing over something, like the time the mosque's congregation requested silence during the two hours of prayer on a Friday afternoon. Her mother had sulked for days. The neighbors had become tacit enemies for weeks thereafter, pretending that everything was fine, but withholding usually dispensed favors and turning away when neighbors struggled with shopping parcels. Ella's eyes found the spot where her father had once stood from early morning to late night, scoring and sewing bits of leather, and only sitting when he took his half-hour lunch that always consisted of warmed-up leftovers that her mother carried down to him, so he could see everyone and they could see him. Baby's leather belts and handbags were known everywhere and by everyone. Ella's father had said, unlike some other tenants, he didn't mind who he sold to. Money was money, as long as customers could pay. But from what Ella could see and hear, her father had his own private hierarchy. The anemic madams who arrived from town in pretty dresses always received their ways in brown paper bags with handles. The sun-baked missies who left the house in their slippers, sunshine or rain, had their purchases placed in thin plastic sacks that split as soon as they walked off, while the ebony-skinned mamas in worn housecoats had their leather goods wrapped in newspaper, and they left carrying it tucked under their arms. And when police made their daily pilgrimage, her father stood back, looked down and said, Sir and Meneer, and never turned on the charm that he was notorious for with a woman. Perhaps that was why. The taxi rang? That wasn't there before. And girls in school dresses leaning into the minivan taxis, talking to men who wore their sunglasses on the tips of their noses and smiled askew. Names that had once been said under cover of darkness as whispers to comrades or shouted at people invited in to work when the sun was up, but who were banished as evening took over, were now said with normality. Tandi, Sipo, Tembi. And Nigerians and Sudanese, Ella guessed, selling strands of once useless wire, morphed into exotic beaded orange elephants, metallic green giraffes, and multicolored fruit bowls. Elsewhere, packets of sweets and cigarettes were sold, while on the other side, a young woman in hijab bent over her singer sewing machine, 
pedaling furiously as she sewed together two mismatched bits of cloth. This no one would have imagined twenty years ago. I had to leave. I won't apologize, Ella said suddenly, answering an unasked question. Rich lady like you don't have to apologize. The old woman's face warped as if she had caught a whiff of decay escaping from the refrigerator again. But you could have come when he died. Ella had received the news like a notice from yesteryear, a black and white telegram informing her that her father was dead. Ella had sat with a letter in her hand for hours. He was gone. She knew that she should have felt some relief that it was finally over, but instead Ella felt an unreasonable, colossal sadness. She thought about flying home, but each time she reached for the phone to make a reservation, her hand froze on the receiver. No, I couldn't, Ella said quietly to herself now, as she continued to look out of the window. Doesn't matter any more. Let me make you a cup of tea, the old woman said before Ella could say no. Her mother leaned onto the chair and pushed herself into a standing position. Raised, the old woman was barely taller than the height that she was seated at. She walked to the kitchen, her back still erect and proud, but her legs skeletal and unbalanced. The old woman filled the kettle and reached into the cupboard for a tea bag, sharing it between the two cups and adding a good dose of condensed milk. She hadn't made tea for anyone in years and didn't know what was expected any longer, she thought, looking down at the square. She hardly knew anyone down there any longer, besides some traders who were still seated on the same spot for more than twenty years now. Less had changed with them than she could have imagined. Just the rot that had crept into their bones and had them limping between potatoes and onions, arthritic fingers struggling to open plastic bags. It was a different world from the days when soft music drifted from record players behind lace curtains until a respectable time, instead of the drone that came from taxi stereos pummeling the air into the early hours. Only at prayer time on a Friday would the music stop in those days, when men came from all directions, silent and thoughtful, and entered the brown stone mosque. The two hours of quiet were a peace that had been reached after weeks of negotiation and compromise, but grudges were not carried between adults for long back then. Disagreement was settled over weekly games of cards or over tea drunk hastily at one of the stalls. Square was much too small a place to keep anger alive, and even neighbors stood in the corridors talking about what transpired between those thin walls. They always smiled and greeted as anyone passed by. Those were the days when her legs moved flawlessly, when she had every shade of dress, a hat, pair of shoes and bag to match, when ladies got dressed up to fetch bread from the shop and men attended civic meetings. Everyone had special Sunday outfits stored in their cupboards. Now, girls wore mini skirts that barely hid their underwear and stood around talking to boys when they were meant to be in school learning. She never went into the square any longer, unless she had to. All the good families had left, abandoned her, like everyone else had, she thought. And they had been replaced by strangers who came to build a new existence for themselves and, as they did, removed the last vestiges of her old life. She did what was needed. Everyone did back then. The old woman thought as she started her journey back to the lounge, watching each step and concentrating hard as she gently sloshed tea onto the already stained carpet as she moved. She handed Ella a half-filled cup. Ella stared at the watery mixture in her hand. How did he die? I would tell you peacefully, but seems you lost no sleep, so let me be honest. Five years next month. A stroke finished him off. We had to take him to the local clinic here. There were no sheets on the bed. Anyway... Maybe he could have lived if he had a pension, but he was just a hawker. We had no savings. We had to make do. I sent more than enough money for you to live comfortably on. Besides, he had no savings because what he didn't spend on booze, he threw away at the horses, Ella said, setting down tea, winding her ring around the finger repeatedly and pacing with such determination that her mother settled quietly back into her chair. Why? Ella asked unexpectedly. Why what? I must explain myself to you. You had food and clothes and a proper education because we sacrificed. Your father worked until his fingers were dirty little stubs that couldn't even pick up a fork. He had his problems. We all did back then. But we all sacrificed. We did what we had to, so you wouldn't need to. But now, like everyone your age, you turn around and blame your parents for whatever's wrong. He had his reasons for being that way. Yes, that's what they say. Everyone has their reasons. I've had many years to think about it. Too many. 
And you know what I believe? I think that sometimes there is no higher logic and no complexities. Sometimes there's just right and wrong. No excuses. No looking at our flawed lives and no blaming anyone else. Sometimes all we can rely on is what we see and feel. And all we can trust is the truth. What he did was wrong, Ella said. Her face flushed as she spun at the end of the room and walked in the opposite direction again. But you don't see it, do you? We are two utterly different people. Are we really so different, Ella? Are you better than me? Because if you are, then we did all right by you. If you are, then your father can rest in peace. Don't speak about my father. When you left, you didn't just leave him. You left me too. It wasn't that I left, but that you stayed, mummy, Ella said, and exhausted, sat on the lone wooden chair beside the window. I really must go now, she added limply as an afterthought. Ella, the old woman said, we did wrong. We made mistakes. I must live with them. Don't add more mistakes to those. Ella stood, neatened her skirt and walked slowly across the room, collecting her handbag from the top of the television set. Taking a look around the room, she said quietly, I am here for two weeks. Here is my number at the hotel. You can call. My husband knows everything, but you can still call. She walked towards the door and opened it slowly. Ella, I only found out when you were already old enough to look after yourself, when you could protect yourself, lock your door. Anyway, what would we have done? And where would we have gone, the two of us? Anywhere, mummy. Anywhere but here, Ella said, her voice and face sketching defeat, before she shut the door and began walking away. Her steps receded down the corridor until only the sound of the clock recurred in the midday silence. The old woman sat that way for minutes. She had tried, but those thin walls, a mere imaginary boundary, had let through every sound. The old woman got up and checked the time on the kitchen wall. It was after twelve and she was late taking her pills. 